Dr. Turk, you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Hi, Paul Turk. Thanks for coming. Um, I, I think you introduced me, but you know, my basic approach to men in this world is fertility is a way to get them some great care because they don't get a lot of care. And so that's the reason for this meeting, this, this session, is that the way that men, men get care is through their partners. So most of the care delivered to men is through their partners. It's the marriage protection hypothesis. So it's what happens. I mean, uh, men are either in pain and they'll get care, or their life is threatened and they'll get care, but they're not going to just go and get a sperm count. A lot of them, it's very difficult to do. So this is our opportunity to say what you can do for them. Fabulous. And Patrick, how about you? Tell us more. I've been training for um, over 18 years, and I work full-time since then. And what I mean by that is, is just to put it in perspective, I work about 50-hour weeks, hands-on with clients. So I've dealt with um, pain man I, de I deal with a lot of pain management. I help people stay pain-free, which is directly related to having a, a healthy sex life and a healthy uh, fertility. So... Um, Training all these celebrities, it, it is fun seeing uh, your results on the big screen and in television, but I do train people from all walks of life, and I love what I do. Uh, I do have passion for helping as many people as I can because I, I witnessed my father uh, have type 2 diabetes, and the last 15 years of his life was not pretty. But that's where I have this, this drive to help as many people as I can with being as healthy as possible. Fantastic to hear, and you can learn more about Patrick at murphyfitness.com. Um, with that, I think Dr. Turk wants to teach us a few things, lead us through, and I'm sure Patrick will add in as we go, what every woman needs to know about her man's fertility. Dr. Turk, you That'd wanna start great. us off? Sure, let's do a little slide, which uh, is just gonna be for your information, but this is a, a woman's guide to men. So we wanna talk about a healthy body being a healthy reproductive body. That's not really, we wanna talk about fertility as a lead indicator of health. So a biomarker in essence. So this is actually important for that reason. And it may be a predictor of future health. So your fertility status as a man could predict your health in the future and things that could go on. And how maybe some ways to take care of your men. So here's what we're talking about, the human male. Also I think I recognize this guy, the Geico caveman, also, right? Also called testosterone ex ex excessivus. <laughs> um, and uh, I've been studying this species for about 20 years. Uh, with research and clinically, and I can give you some, some, some summary of them. They're common, uh, but they're quirky. Uh, they're born in quadrupeds, so they walk on all fours, and then they stand up, so they're bipeds as they get older. They're monogamous, serially monogamous, or polygamous. They're constantly in motion, they're ritualistic, and they're occasionally creative. <laughs> they're often self-destructive, and they're occasionally altruistic and their longevity varies widely with their habitat and their habits. So this is the species we're talking about. Let me show you one of the most highly evolved of the species that we could find. <laughs> so I have one question to start this off, which is for Patrick. Got me on that right there. <laughs> which is, I love the beard today, yeah. is, is um, what, what do men do that sabotages their ability to stay healthy? What, what, in, your, in your practice, what do you find that they're doing? How do they, how, what keeps yeah. men from being healthy? You know, I'll tell you right now, I find that many of the men I work with take too much focus into their job and they let their own personal health go to, go to waste. They let themselves, they age themselves through, the, through uh, just give you a quick example. You, you have a job that you're, you're married to and you're so into it and you get these high stressful days and a lot of people wind down by what? Having a cocktail or two at the end of the night. And then, 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 then that in turn affects uh, quality sleep. So that's a vicious cycle, especially for a healthy fertility system, a reproductive system. Um, it also depends on what men, uh, what type of friends they have. What kind of, you know, if you hang out with a group of guys that uh, frequents bars more than they do gyms, then you're not gonna be as a healthy person uh, in general. Um, and then there's all these other uh, types of, uh, what type of food relationships men have. The, you know, food's very highly addictive. The highly refined processed foods are very highly addictive. Soda is very highly addictive. So there's these, these ingrained habits that they do over and over again that aren't necessarily good for them. 
And when you when you're training men to keep them healthy, do you do you talk about that stuff? Absolutely. Their food and what you know, and then where they go after work, and why don't you do this instead? Is that is it part of the lifestyle thing that you do? Absolutely. Well, it's a step process. So everyone comes from a different place, and uh, I, I could be really hard on people, and I could I could be really easy and take baby steps. But the good news is, baby steps still equal great results over time. Um, but uh, it's what it's. It's the culture, you know, we live in. Um, just a quick example of that would be uh, the sit-down job, you know, that wreaks havoc on the human body, you know. If the perfect anatomical position for the human body is standing with your hands beside you, what I mean by that is your length and tension relationships of your muscle are at their best, the body and the brain operates most efficiently with good posture and alignment. So the sit-down job definitely... Uh, wreaks havoc on the body in so many ways. So do you ask your clients or do you recommend that they try to adjust by maybe asking for a standing workstation or, or I mean, if, if they're, you know, somebody that works behind a desk all day and, and, and what do you do, like if you're the wife, what do you do about that social circle? I mean, being married to someone English, pub culture, it's hard to get around. It's just part of what they do. So it's almost like... But what we do, it, the key word here is awareness. So I bring awareness to my clients. Uh, right now, my spine is slightly flexed, and I feel it. And when your spine is slightly flexed, muscles for in, in a lengthened state for a long period of time get very weak. And that's just an example of awareness. Um, and then, obviously, I give them the tools to uh, fix posture, send the positive signals to your brain, because what we're doing all day, if you don't have the awareness, is sending a bunch of negative signals to your brain. And then you become that. You're affected by that. So it's... Uh, Birth of habit, right? Of that habit. Exactly. So let's start with what to do about men. How's a uh, penis like how's a heart? How's a penis like a heart? So this is why things matter. So this is a curve showing men with problems with erections and their rates of heart attacks. So erections and heart attacks. So having an erection problem as a man, that's real, not situational or stress-related, but real and organic, which we see in our practices is the same risk of having a heart attack later in life as smoking, if they're a smoker, or if they have a family history of a heart attack. So it's, it's one of the highest risk factors. That, that's truth. It's about 10 years of data. So a man with a real erection problem, is certainly gonna have a fertility problem with that, is, is really at, at a likelihood. And so, you know, that's an important issue. So the way we approach this in the practice is, I have this planetary view of erections, and this is, on this slide you'll see the things that I think about when a man comes in with an erection problem. And half the slide is about health. I mean, really we're talking obesity, cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, sleep, medications, and there's a bunch of other things here. So it's not about testosterone, usually. It's not about a lot of things. It's a lot about what Patrick's doing. A lot of this is obesity, heart disease, and things like that. So that's the view. It's a health, healthy body, healthy reproductive body. So, you know, I think that's important. So um, is, is Patrick like the Viagra of, of the planetary view then? Patrick, a natural Viagra? Patrick is, yes, Patrick <laughs> is the cure for erections. Forget Viagra. Go Forget see Patrick. Viagra. I mean, honestly. Hey, why not? You, you are central <laughs> to the erection. <laughs> I, stem, I stem all of these issues uh, to the lack of circulation. So, of course, exercise increases circulation. Uh, exercise will uh, provide strength for your heart. And, um, I mean, let's be honest here. So exercise is an action, and so is sex. Sex is an action, and we are creatures of habit. And the, when you do something over and over again, whether it's good for you or not, you get really good at it. So if you exercise a lot, it's kind of common sense science that you're going to be pretty good at the act of sex and performance. Uh, so getting someone uh, really physical and active on a weekly basis uh, will only help. Um, that, that might be a good one to get us ladies to get our guys to go to the gym, actually. Absolutely. You'll get better at sex. There you go. Better shape. Oh, this is a, a good one for us ladies, too. Wise words. Anybody who believes that made a man's heart is through his stomach definitely flunked geography. But, you know, a man will come to the doctor for an erection problem, and that's a real opportunity. It's a real opportunity to change his health. Another thing involved with fertility for women, sex drive, 
right? Who doesn't have issues with sex drive ever? I mean, who's, you know, it's a, it's a common problem. It's important that to know that sex level, sex drive levels differ among individuals, like breathing patterns or heart rates, and everyone has has their own. And when you meet somebody, it's often that you know they're lower or higher than you are, and that's part of the relationship developing is to figure out how you're going to work it out. But what's a, what it becomes a problem is if that changes. So if a man has a low or high level and it's changing dramatically, then that's a concern. That's, a, that's when I jump on it, and then medically. And you know, you get a lot of men in for in sex drive and, and for this and that, and you've got to try to figure it out. And I think oysters can improve it. I wrote a blog on this, oysters, <laughs> sex, and you. Um, but it's really a, a good level. It's good zinc. Uh, oysters are good zinc, but maybe it's the champagne with it. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing. When I evaluate a man for a sex drive issue, it's the same suspects. It's the planetary view. It's the same thing. It's not testosterone. It's usually something else. Sleep, stress, health. Look at the upper left-hand picture on this curve. It's all Patrick. It's all about a healthy body. Patrick, what do you think exercise does for sex drive? Well, you brought up one of the most, I guess you can say, the most important muscle in the body, the heart. So the more efficient the heart is... I'm a urologist. That would be the second most important muscle. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. I, I understand what you're saying. The, uh, but the heart is the, um, the more efficient your heart is, the slower it beats. To strengthen your heart muscle, you need to use it. And that's where exercise comes in, uh, the type of training you can do to maximize the full potential of your heart. So the more efficient your heart is, the better circulation you, you will have and the better fertility and performance you will have. Good. So Another reason. Let's go on sex drive a little bit more because there's a lot of data on sleep and sex drive. So, you know, we sleep six and a half hours a night on average. We used to sleep seven and a half hours 10 years ago. We require seven to nine physiologically. It won't kill you if you don't get it, but a lot of other things happen. You wear out faster without good sleep. So here's the things you can do to improve your sex drive. Less caffeine and alcohol. Exercise. Inner, de eat dinner early so you don't the thing about metabolism, relax after work, keep a sleep schedule, and take sleep aid and medications. And I think, Patrick, you talked about this with the work intervening, like the, the, this, the connectivity at work and not putting it down. And the title of the Ben Lee's um, CD cover is Awake is the New Sleep. And that seems to be a problem. I'm in Northern California, lots of tech. And these guys work hard and constantly, and they're constantly connected. Right. And here they're, they're in, you probably find that they're in the car a lot, captive, yeah. can't and sleep. And there's different stressors here, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, how I do, do you wanna, find sleep? I do want to say a quick point, because yeah. you had said that word alcohol again. The, the fact of the matter is alcohol is a toxin. Alcohol is very acidic. And I do know for a fact that when you have high acid, your, your blood becomes like sludge. So there goes the lack of circulation that we need for healthy fertility and reproduction, and 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 obviously to have a healthy re erection. Really important, yeah. If you don't yeah. have an erection, you're probably not going to have kids naturally. But I'm wondering about the sleep schedule piece. Um, do you do you counsel your clients on sleep? I think sleep is something you touched on it's earlier. It's such a common. It's it's our modern problem. Well, that's a modern problem. Yes, absolutely. I mean, he, uh, sleep heals the body. Sleep helps uh, recover from oxidative stress throughout the day. Uh, sl sleep is like a reset for the brain. Um, so if you don't get enough sleep, it does wreak havoc on your body in how so many different ways. Do you, how much sleep do you recommend to your clients? I mean, I would imagine a lot of them probably can't get enough sleep either. I would say seven hours, okay. which I need to work on also. Yeah, we all do, right? Mm -hmm. oh. Do people sleep better if they exercise regularly? Do you Absolutely. think that's true? Absolutely. So when we exercise, we it creates homeostasis, it creates equilibrium, it balances all our hormones, it re, uh, reduces uh, stress in so many ways. The, the endorphins, the good feeling uh, or endorphins are, are boosted and um, they are, uh, it's just nothing but a win-win situation when we're active. So let's talk about sex drive and stress because that's probably the biggest issue in my practice is sex drive and stress. So I just look at men as as the Geico man. I mean, we're basically cavemen. We're 50,000 years away from cavemen. We have the same nervous systems. And a man under stress, and let's call it a travel schedule or 
We can call it financial stress, or we can call it work stress, or physical stress. What happens? So what nervous system are you activating? It's sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. So 50,000 years ago, you weren't taking planes, but what were you doing? You're running from woolly mammoths. <laughs> so, you know, right? And so you run from woolly mammoths. What do you want, an erection? You want a sex drive? You're trying to save your life, right? Everything, you know, stress kills fertility. It's because what we used to do is run. And now we're not running. And I love the beard today, Patrick, because it just it's a great thing. It's the woolly, it's the, the caveman thing. You got to do it. Get out there, get some exercise, stay and do it, because that's what we used to do. <laughs> And these are our woolly mammoths, physical stress, financial stress, emotional stress, connectivity. So Circadian what is, travel stress, yeah, too. Travel absolutely. is another one that's a killer. So what does exercise do for stress? The stress, uh, first of all, when we are in a stressful state, that when physically, uh, let me just tell you that 80% of Americans have back pain. Uh, I don't know about you, but when I was in a bad car accident, the last thing I thought about was intimacy uh, with, my, with my wife. Uh, when we are in pain, the last thing we do, well, first of all, it brings depression also, uh, will it definitely affect our, our fertility and our reproductive system. Um, the body always responds to stress first before any of our systems want to operate efficiently. So exercise will only help improve the healing process of stress reduce uh, the two stress hormones are cortisol and insulin and that will help regulate uh, and level them out uh, every time you, you do a workout. I love Absolutely. it when he uses big words like that. <laughs> <laughs> so rest and restore. That's the goal to get rid of stress. Rest and restore. So regular exercise, massage, acupuncture, yoga, Get your body down, get it tired, get those hormones in balance. That is a great prescription for, these, for men, and I see sex drive goes up when they take care of themselves. Self-esteem goes up, the whole thing. And that's really important for fertility, clearly. So infertility, so let's talk about infertility because that's what women need to know about their men, right? So what do you get? So it's not a semen analysis. So fertility is more than a semen analysis. It's a history and a physical, and you can see what's affecting things. It's a semen analysis, and it could be hormonal, and, and those, that's sort of the initial valuation. So if you ask me the most important thing that a man needs, it's a history and physical, because the past history of paternity is probably more important than a semen analysis if you had to choose. And I actually wrote the board question for that one. Guess what we think about when we think about the causes of male infertility? The same suspects. The same things. Healthy body, you add a varicocele in there, and testosterone may matter a little more on this one, but it's really the same thing. It's really stress and sleep and metabolic components and the healthy body and the healthy heart. Obesity, classic cause of low sperm count, and diabetes, et cetera, diseases, medications. So I always say, you know, your body wants to run hard. Your sperm count wants to be high. It doesn't want to be low. It wants to be high. It's an engine. It's running full tilt, and all you can do is poison it. So by smoking and not sleeping and getting stressed, you drop its, its ability to do it. And it's, I'm sure you see that with exercise, right? Absolutely. Um, everything from blood pressure to uh, every, every system in our body will operate more efficiently through exercise. It's all connected. So, I mean, why not? Right. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if what what is the saying? Uh, use it or lose it. Yeah. What about nutrition? I mean, in terms of what you recommend, and I mean, eating is a big part of this too. As much you know, fuel in, fuel out, Absolutely. garbage in, garbage out. You touched on refined foods earlier. Yeah, well, what do you recommend for people to? I mean, for for what are, should guys be eating? I know there's not one thing for every guy, but is there a guideline that you you give to your? Clientele? Well, back well back to stress, like insulin, for example. So if you eat highly refined processed foods, they absorb rapidly, and then we ruin the insulin glucose relationship, mm -hmm. and we're in a pro-inflammatory state the whole time we eat foods that are highly processed. Um, cortisol can be spiked uh, drinking too much caffeine. So if you're already a stressful person and you drink okay. too much caffeine, it exacerbates it. Um, so there's many things that we can do to sabotage. How much is too much caffeine? Because, I mean, that's huge. I mean, people live on caffeine nowadays. That's true. I'm going to go over 300 milligrams. Now, 
different places. How many ounces is that, like well, roughly? The, I cups mean, of coffee. <laughs> we have you, you, cups of coffee uh, are different. Uh, you know, I, I don't even want to name the chain, but some cups of coffee are over three hundred uh, and twenty milligrams per cup, and oh. others are only one hundred and twenty. So, so, as ladies, maybe get the labels of these places, find out, and maybe try to work out. Maybe you add a lot of water, hot water to drinks or something. I'm not saying don't drink coffee, but I will share this. The non-organic coffee bean is the highest chemicalized food commodity in the world. So if you're going to drink coffee, drink organic coffee. That's a good start. You'll, you'll so spend where, an extra 50 cents. So just a second on this, because you know those of us in L.A., how do you, how, where do you go and get a brewed cup of organic coffee, right? Because, I mean, I'll say at Starbucks, I don't think they have organic they do. coffee. They, they do. They do, and they use the... Uh, what? Have a cup at Patrick's in the morning. Just stop by his little yeah. pot. And <laughs> <laughs> I think he's going to be busy with his wife yep. and kids. That's probably. just something to think about. Organic coffee, please, if you're going to have so coffee. So ask for it at some of the bigger Absolutely. chains. They do have that option. Yes. Um, and then, of course, seek it out for your home. Yes, I would imagine. Absolutely. Okay. And it's not good, good much tips. more expensive. Great. So I just want to spend a couple minutes on something uh, that male infertility can symbolize. So one is we talked about general health and it being maybe suboptimal in infertility, and infertility is the marker. And so revealing underlying pathology is our job, right? We want to make sure that the guy is a healthy guy and that's not and it's it's not, you know, the infertility is not caused by a disease. And, and then also treating infertility probably makes more sense in most cases than going to technology. So I don't do any technology. I like to poke fun at it and publish how we do better work when we treat the men than the technology can so do. By technology, you mean IVF, Test right? Test to baby stuff, all that. Of course, I love it. I mean, I wouldn't have a practice without it. Some men absolutely have to have it, cancer survivors, et cetera. But, and I also respect women's age and women's health a lot too because that determines what they do in lots of cases. But it really makes sense to treat men, especially lifestyle issues. Because you're not only helping his sperm count and helping him have a kid, you may be adding years to his life. So when a man comes in and he's smoking and he, you know, he wants an antioxidant supplement or he doesn't cut, and I say, listen, you know, do it for her, do it for the kid. Are you going to smoke when you have a baby? Are you going to go outside and smoke? And then if he does it, I'll tell him on the phone, I'll say, congratulations, you just added five years to your life. Because that's the real goal, is to is get a healthy guy out of it. And, and five everything. more years with that child. And yes. I mean, you're working towards this goal, and you got to think of the end game, work time with yeah. the family. So I'm, I'm, I'll, I, I do play dirty chess with them like that. But, <laughs> but I'm trying to keep them alive. And, um, you know, they are, their habits kill them. Uh, car accidents, the number one cause of death in young men, you know, car accidents and accidents in general. And then the issue is, is, it a, is infertility a window to future health? And the answer is yes. So... You know, a man has a path in his life, and here's an example of a path. You're wiggling your way through, and you follow a path. And then at some age, you're infertile. And that is picked up, treated, or bypassed. And you get a kid through technology. You're not necessarily cured. But we're finding now that the other things can come up later in life, after the infertility. And our specific work is on cancer. And we published a couple papers. You don't have the details. But testis cancer rates in previously infertile men with a male factor, are twice or three times higher than men without that problem. Prostate cancer rates are two to three-fold higher later in life. So we use that as the control cancer. We said, well, prostate cancer is a cancer of men when they're really old, so it's unlikely to be genetic or environmental, really. We don't really know, but it's just going to be one of the ones that will be the same, and it will use that as our standard. Lo and behold, prostate cancer was up, testis cancer was up, and that led to mechanisms. And you know, maybe there is a problem early in life. Maybe it's developmental. Maybe it's genetic. The first problem that comes from that, or the first sign, is the infertility. And the second sign is a different problem. And one of the classic mechanisms might be low testosterone, might be one, or uh, DNA mismatch repair, your ability to fix your, your problems in your DNA on a routine basis. So it's fascinating. But I am all about the biomarker concept uh, with male infertility. So that's it for slides. I'm going to do one more, which is our prescriptions for healthy sperm for women, for the men, or for the partners. And so do you have a prescription? Your prescription is the base, same as mine based on this talk. Well, What's your uh, prescription for a healthy body? There's 10 or 12 here, eating right, sleeping well, staying lean. It's just summarizing what we talked about. Exercise, limit booze, stay cool, stash the cell. 
We can talk about that a little bit. Mobile yeah. phones, right? Yep. Right, is what you mean there? That's no good. cigs, no weed, avoid pills, avoid smelly solvents and pesticides. Don't sweat the small stuff. Stress free. And avoid sitting, which you got avoid to sitting. earlier. Yeah. That's yeah, true. Uh, I could take it farther with the eat right. I, I do take it farther. So it, let's um, let's use some common sense here. Uh, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, synthetic hormones, animal animal antibiotics. Let's say you never eat organic ever. You're forcing your body to deal with that. It's real. It's in the food industry, and um, our livers are amazing. They're the chief detoxifier of our bodies. But over time they will not work, your liver won't work as efficiently. So you're forcing your body to deal with all these toxins and synthetics and artificial dyes, la la la. That's something to think about. Maybe just start introducing more organic foods into your diet to uh, help your body operate more efficiently and getting away from a pro-inflammatory state. Um, but I, I also recommend the, uh, I do this no processed food diet all foods are not meant for everyone. We all have different food sensitivities and different food allergies. Like if I tell you eat beans, they're, they're great. They're high fiber, they have protein source, they absorb slowly. It doesn't mean beans are good for you. So it's a discovery, awareness of the individual. Uh, but you obviously would wanna try to stay away from the highly refined processed foods. So that's a basic recommendation. Yeah. And how much exercise, say for fertility, optimal fertility, how much Exercise should a man get in what caliber, what level? I try to get all my clients a minimum five days a week, and what that entails is a minimum of two resistance training days a week to maintain and or gain muscle mass on your body. The more muscle is fat-burning tissue, uh, muscle supports your joints. The more uh, muscle you have on your body, the, uh, the higher your metabolism will be. It's kind of a form of anti-aging when you keep muscle on your body. Uh, cardiovascular exercise three days a week. And, uh, and that's that minimums. Uh, that's my minimum. I, I don't for actors who want to lose sixty pounds. This is no, everyday. People. How did he do that? <laughs> it's just it has to become. You know, it's like it's like someone getting a cup of coffee every morning. It's 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 a you you, you make it a habit, a strong ritual. Right. And 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 to to strengthen that to make it happen, you roughly want to do it the same time every day. So look. You know, I, I was blessed to, to meet Dr. Turek from my own experience with my husband. And, you know, one of the things that we went through that maybe a lot of the ladies here went through was what is that magic age? You know, for a woman, you know, over 35, they say if you're trying for six months and nothing's happened, you're doing everything right, you've, you know, your prescription, you know, we're, we're, we're taking your prescription – when should a guy see a male fertility specialist? Is that where they go? Do they go to a urologist? I know on our path, a regular we went to many ure regular urologists, and they 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 didn't know they were they were still not getting things like um, giving testosterone is causes sterility. Good, right? Yeah, right. So good I for mean, one, bad for the other. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because I think we're all like yesterday's what is that session magic age? was excellent on testosterone, uh, but. It is, it's great for your erections, potentially, great for your sex drive, potentially, but not really, but terrible for fertility because it's exogenously given. So you need to have your own testosterone for better fertility. So you can't take testosterone. And is it dangerous with this FDA warning that we've heard? So I, I have a blog on that called Testosterone Worries, and, and I think my statement is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Everyone deserves a normal testosterone level, but when you're taking, so everyone deserves from low to normal, but going from normal to high, is dangerous. That's where risk comes in. Okay. And so I would say the warning came out from the FDA recently that not all men do, that it could be related to heart attacks and strokes. These were all older men with with heart disease who were given it, and it was within six months of taking it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very high risk group for cardiac those events, and uh, hard to know whether it's ascribable or not. It's just being reviewed, but. You know, maybe it's true. Maybe if you're old with heart disease and you're about to die of it, you shouldn't get on testosterone. Okay, so that's testosterone. But it, but let's go back to age. So you're you're 35 or over as the woman, and you know you need you you're not having a child, so you know you need to see a specialist. At that point, should that also trigger? I mean, what's the percentage likelihood that there's something going on with your husband or partner? What should you know, what age should the guy start getting checked? So you're asking that you've met somebody and you're 60 as a guy and you're wondering whether you should get checked out before you start trying? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming men just think that they're going to be normal and they just 
Oh boy, that oh my god, she's well, pregnant. Well, either way. So so let's say so let's say I'm, you know, I'm over 35 and I'm with a guy of of any age. Is there an age for men oh. that should, should trigger an evaluation? Should trigger an evaluation exactly. I would say no. But I, you know, I mean, there a lot of things happen as men age, so they they don't really lose a sperm count men as they age except for one final mo- moment which is quite a sort of andropause, which is the male menopause which occurs in the eighth decade. So then you have to worry because it drops like a, like a brick. But until then, men's sperm counts don't really fall with age. Does their fertility fall? Yes. But their sperm counts, it won't see it in the sperm so count. That's why we see guys like Jack Nicholson have kids way into their 60s. Mm-hmm. So, so is there risk with that, though? Yes. Well, what are so, the risks? I mean, so the jaculate volume may fall, and the motility, the movement of the sperm may be poorer, and the fertility may be declining just because sex drive and erection issues are going on, and the frequency of sex is down. So it's a very complicated feature because fertility is not a sperm count. But the sperm counts are remarkably preserved. We just published a paper looking at vasectomy reversal outputs of sperm after vasectomy reversal in vasectomies that were 30, 40 years old, and they were the same as the men who had five-year-old vasectomies or fertile men. I mean, the output is tremendous. It doesn't really go down. Even if you block it for 30 years, it still jumps back and makes the same amount of sperm in a healthy guy. Yeah, you said that the, the condom is, or sorry, the... The vasectomy the, is the new condom, yeah. For, for obviously, for it's couples and committed relationships. Think. Yeah, it's more I mean, reversible it's, than you, know. you think. Well, that's all good to know, but, but I know you... So paternal age is an issue, and it's a very active issue. And in the New York Times, that's the article tomorrow, is about paternal age issues. And uh, okay, so that's... there are people who are freezing sperm because they're worried about, they don't have a kid, they're single, they're guys, and they're wondering if they should freeze their sperm so that it's younger when they do want a kid. It's sort of like the egg issue. It's very easy to freeze eggs now. Should I do it while I still have them or while they're younger? And that's, that's now falling off a little into the men's, sort of spilling out into the world of men's health. And, um, well, so, we'll look for that tomorrow. I just want to okay. make sure we get some audience questions in here. Um, do we have a mic in the room? Looks like we have a question here up front. Sarah, do you have the mic? Because we have a question here. I want to make sure our online audiences can't hear unless you use the mic. There's this uh, huge uh, Swedish study that just came out relative to uh, the significant increase in psychic defects for men over 45. And uh, done on 2.6 million Swedish children born this last some decades. And what are your thoughts with with regard to that paper and having uh, 45 as a sort of like a concern zone for having psychic uh, offspring. I mean, I, I don't want to s- alarm people, but uh, this the whole entire Swedish birth registry was tracked for 10 years and it was like 2 million births. And older paternal age is linked directly to autism and directly to schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. So these are adult disease. Some of them are autism is a kid disease, but adult diseases in children can be due to paternal age. And the mechanism is probably the quality control in sperm genetics, it's it's just wearing out. So should women be concerned if their partner is over 45? Uh, you know, the answer is yes. Okay. And, and it might be what's driving autism rates, but another really good nature study that was published from Decode Genetics in Iceland, which has a grip, uh, a clamp on the whole Icelandic population genetics, <laughs> said that in a molecular study that it's probably driven, 20% of that is probably driven by sperm. Uh-huh. By sperm and then the quality control mechanisms of sperm. So. It's unfolding as we speak, it's real. There's molecular data and there's epidemiologic data. Those are two kinds of data, they agree. Um, and well, and you're, you're speaking on paternal age, I think at a conference next month, so it'll yeah. probably be on your blog as well, right? Yes. Okay, good. So I, I don't want to alarm people, but there's nothing to test for. There's nothing you can do about it. I mean, I guess it's part of how you judge your partner. <laughs> but, um, and, and the other most important point is that when you compare these rates and their changes with men's age, are about one-tenth as significant as the rate of chromosomal problems that occur with female age in offspring and in embryos. So, you know, there are similar curves. They go, um, and so they're dramatic, but statistically dramatic. But when you look at the actual incidence and rates that actually occurs, it's still very low. Okay. These are talking one, two, three percent versus something, you know, for women, it's, you're looking at pregnancies that are one in 25, one in 20 in their 40s, things like that. So those rates of chromosomal issues were not the same 
are much higher, much more driven by female maternal age issues than male, but the males do, do contribute. Good to know. So do we have other questions in our audience here? Looks like we have another. Thank you. Great talk. Um, my question is, I have a husband who is tired and stressed, and he lives off of two monster drinks a day and a frozen pizza at 1030 at night, and that's his coping. And as the wife, I've always found him not as open to the suggestions of a different diet. But looking at you and listening to you, Patrick, I'm wondering if he would be inspired or motivated by a personal trainer. And I'm not really sure what's the best way to introduce him to a personal trainer, whether it's at a gym or hiring someone individually. I just wonder what your thoughts are. Well, first, you're, first of all, your, your husband can email me anytime. <laughs> what's your Absolutely. email address? Patrick at murphyfitness.com. But I, I do want to let you know, though, if you drink a monster drink and get your blood work done, it shows up as amphetamines. It's, um, it's it also the, the artificial sweeteners in monster drinks are 600 times sweeter than sugar. So these things are very, very addictive. And people, it's hard to let go. It's hard to let go of those, those sodas. So it's not just caffeine. No, no. This is an elixir of an addiction yeah. beverage that is very acidic. It just, it's one of the most unhealthy beverages I can think of on the planet. Any soda. So she's saying there's fatty liver involved. You know, I mean, you've you've probably seen this before. Oh yeah, the, those those so sodas are just as bad. <laughs> yes. So. so you would call them poisons? Absolutely, D guaranteed, absolute poison. Uh, the body's being taxed very much, and um, that creates insulin resistance, uh, diabetes, um, dementia, and exactly exactly where my father ended up. So changes do need to be made, and uh, I'm more than happy to uh, talk to him. He can throw me an email. I'm more so than happy to spend some time with him. Would you recommend trying to train together? I mean, is that something that maybe would work? Have you? I mean, have you ever talked to people trying to get their husbands into the gym? And uh, I'm doing this, honey. Can you join me? <laughs> that happens all the time. Okay. That happens all the time. So if, if you have uh, a team around you, you, you stay with it. If one person's not on the same team, it's, it's a struggle. So maybe so, that's something you can do together. That's absolutely. Good. That's a good suggestion. So birthday gift or you know anniversary gift, something like that. Sounds great. Make sure it's a woman who's training. <laughs> do we <laughs> do you have want them to do it? No, just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have other questions? We have someone here. You mentioned that sperm count doesn't um, isn't the same thing as fertility in males. Can you kind of maybe expand a little more on that? Because I'm yeah, I mean, confused. that's the basis for the sperm counts are not necessarily fertility. So, classic examples: vasectomy reversal. The man comes into your office with a zero sperm count. You do a procedure, and he just spools up over time. Right? He's getting his sperm count back after the reversal, and then he gets pregnant. They get pregnant, and then you, if you look at the sperm count at the time that pregnancy occurs after they're zero, it'll it's hardly ever normal normal by any standard. Is it low or high? It's usually lower, yeah. I mean, you don't need a normal sperm count to conceive, and that's a classic example of an untested couple who's trying and they're actually fertile. You know, my life is skewed by a lot of low sperm counts because of infertility, but unless it's zero, you can't make a hard statement about the semen analysis and infertility, unless it's zero. I have conceptions at 60 sperm. I have conceptions at 100,000 sperm. You know, just ridiculous. I usually hug those women because it's not about the guy. It's about the woman. <laughs> how, how did you do that? How did you yeah. just get pregnant with 60 sperm? He, he was telling us before about how um, he gets people after reversals that get really disappointed because they're not going to be able to, to try anymore because the pregnancy men, men occurred so quickly. Men will call me angry. Like, it wasn't supposed to work. You said it was six to nine months. That she's gonna, it's two months. I'm really upset. There goes my sex life. But she's pregnant already. It's a nice problem to have, I think. We have other questions? Yeah, One second, just wait for the mic. There you go. Hi, how does the morphology change between, you know, younger than 45, you're using that, I would look a little older even, you know, um, in terms of all of this um, talk about the autism, et cetera, and, and what did they look at in terms of morphology? I didn't. Mm. They didn't look at 
sperm counts or anything. This study was all about age, of paternal age. It's a very high level, 30,000 foot view at rates of diseases and offspring that are in a registry compared to the dad's age. The is there other birth. research besides the study we talked about so earlier? So morphology is a gray area. It's a hard thing to do. It's sperm shape. It's uh, one of the semen analysis parameters. I think it's mostly a reflection of health. I think the factories overheated, underpaid workers putting out a product with a bad paint job. And the headlights are crooked. The engine's fine, though. So generally, with morphology sperm shape, the genetic package is OK. There's a couple of situations where morphology can predict genetic problems in sperm, not necessarily in kids. So it's not a genetic reflection. It's a book, you're judging a book by its cover in, in morphology. So it's not that valuable. Hmm. But it can reflect on health. I mean, there's some syndromes where all the morphology is identical and bad, and that's probably worrisome for stuff, and you wouldn't use the sperm. But most times it's fine. It just looks bad, and it's got a, some minor abnormalities. Do we have another question? Looks like we. Um, what you just said may actually answer my question, but I wanted to ask it anyway. Um, when you talk about different parts of different types of fertility for men, um, if their count is very high and they're um, less than 35 years old, but the motility is the major factor, um, this prescription would you say that that falls on um, the same thing, or does that predict something else? That's a great question, and it wasn't answered, and the answer okay. is, I mean, I wrote a blog on this called Reading Your Cards. So you're handed a deck of cards. What's the volume mean? What's the count mean? What's the motility mean? This isn't, this is sort of, you know, highly philosophical approach to it, but I look at it as the count means output is fine, so he's hormonally fine. His system is putting out good numbers of sperm, and that's the job of the testicle. So that means it's pretty good. And motility is a post-production event, occurs in the epididymis and elsewhere. So I look at it as, as something, there's a minor poison going on to this. It's not a big enough one to hit the count in production or be you know, something bad, but something's poisoning this guy. Stress, varicocele, hot tubs, something. I look for something on the intake that's gonna give it a lifestyle issue, something that's just keeping them down a little bit. So, so it's a more sensitive barometer of health than the count is. Can, count will go down when it, there's a bigger hit. And that can include medications, right? Yeah, even absolutely. Because it, even what we heard in yesterday's session, um, male fertility session, was some common medications that guys take, can, their, their general practitioner may not know even cause infertility, right? Yeah. So make sure you get it checked. Yeah, like for instance, hair medication, Propecia, is now got FDA warning as a male fertility pill. We've been, su been suspicious for years because we see guys with these unexplained low counts and this and that, and we stop it and they recover, and now it's got an FDA warning as a fertility pill. Now this is a pill that basically reproductive age ta men take almost exclusively, but it's got a terrible track record. And there are more subtle things going on in sperm like DNA fragmentation, which changes with age, and the author of that science is in this audience tonight, today, so he's a good one to talk to about it. So there's, it's complicated, but uh, it's simple. Do we have time for another question? Since Paul mentioned the topic of sperm DNA fragmentation, our company SEC said diagnostics, we just looked at the, uh, the uh, uh, age of man and the level of DNA fragmentation in the three, last 3,000 patients we've looked at. And in fact, the stage rather steady up to age about 40, and about age 40 into 45, it goes very sharply up. In fact, the, uh, the curve probably might be almost close to what you have for the idiopathic, uh, the psychic di disorders, that at 45 you have significant problems. And again, Professor, I'm going to translate that in English. Okay. So Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. So Thank you. sperm function, not, to not, not the team, that, not the guys that go out on the team, you know, the 11 guys out on the field, but the way they play ball changes dramatically, and one of the measures of that is the fragmentation of the DNA in the sperm. It doesn't cause birth defects and stuff. It just probably causes infertility, and when I said that men have trouble with fertility as they get older, that's probably one of the biggest reasons, is their DNA is a pile of bricks instead of being a nice ladder. And the woman, the egg sees it and says, show me your stuff, and the sperm undresses, and the DNA, and she looks at it, and the egg says, you know, I, I can't fix this. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is beyond help. 
We try to fix everything, but we can't fix some things, right? I love that we have the little sperm pins, too, with the uh, little jewel for the nose. You were telling us it's a nose, not an eyes. eyes. They They don't have eyes. Well, on on that note, unfortunately, we have to wrap the session up. I want to thank both you, Dr. Turek, and Patrick Murphy for being with us. You were fantastic. I hope all of you are thinking now about male infertility in a new way and also how it can be an indicator of health in men and get your guys, you know, whoever it is in your life, get them to see really good doctors. Um, That's the argument of health. Yeah. And health for their kids too. I mean, that was the thing when I went through this, it was learning about it being a biomarker for the future, uh, all of in learning about the important role that exercise. And I mean, such great, like you said, common sense advice about peer groups and all of that, that, you know, just really get them in the right places. So if you need to contact either of these guys to ask them any questions, you can go to fertilityplanet.com. There's a way to submit a question for them. Um, You can also uh, see uh, Dr. Turek at his booth um, upstairs. Uh, We want to thank foratv.com for live streaming and recording Fertility Planet's programs. It's so important to make sure we tell everyone we know that this session took place, that they can find it afterwards um, as a resource as they go through their journeys. Um, The videos are available for free um, on the website of fertilityplanet.com. You can also follow Fertility Planet on Twitter and Facebook, wonderful communities to reach out to and learn more. Again, thank you to our speakers. Thank you so much, Dr. Turek, for the Turek Clinic sponsoring this. Again, locations in Beverly Hills and in San Francisco supporting this great conversation. And thank you so much to you for being here. Um, for, for I know you can feel very lonely as a woman out there. So I encourage you, if you, if you ever want to talk, I'm here. Come find me. Um, Please share your views with us online. Again, the hashtags FPLA14. I'm Jennifer Neely with Jennifer Neely Digital. You can find me online. I'm easy to find. Um, and hope you have a, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>